You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I took $50,000 and put it in and ended up making close to a million. So it was a, uh, it was very interesting, right? Because A, I attributed it mainly to my skill. Um, but what I realized is that I really did nothing. And subsequently, I ended up, you know, my next few investments ended up losing most of that. Thanks for tuning in to MSE. I'm Bill Powers, your host. In today's show, you're going to hear from a listener of Mining Stock Education that I've gotten to know. He's an accredited investor with a, a successful, stable business, which allows him to deploy money into the more speculative resource stocks. He's also experienced a huge win, and you're going to learn in today's show what he did on the other side of that huge win. So Chris Moore, thanks for coming on Mining Stock Education for the first time. Could you please introduce yourself to listeners and how did you get interested in small cap resource stocks? Hey Bill, well, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so I am lucky enough to run a business in a very uh, stable industry as you were saying. and. And so I decided when I graduated from university that I could probably take a little bit more risk, but uh, in doing so, I probably took way too much risk. And uh, as you say, I, I started off my investment career with a with a substantial win. Um, I took fifty thousand dollars and put it in, and ended up making close to a million. So it was a uh, it was very interesting, right? Because a I attributed it mainly to my skill. Um, but what I realized is that I really did nothing. And subsequently, I ended up, you know, my next few investments ended up losing most of that. So that downhill slope, I actually learned way more than the, than the benefit of, of gaining a lot of money. Can you give us uh, an idea of how you found this big, you know, 20 bagger, 50 thousand dollars to a million what was the process of that like <laughs> i kind of fell into it you know you know you're recently out of university still have connection with high school i had a very intelligent very smart fellow that i still keep in touch with now who worked for this small little technology company uh so blindly i put a lot of money into it um but hey guess what was going on at the same time the dot-com bubble right so yeah, this uh, little company got swallowed by a huge multinational, which then in turn got swallowed by even a bigger multinational. Unbelievable, unbelievable. But uh, yeah, in the end, actually, interestingly, I didn't, I didn't cash out at the top, um, and ended up giving back thirty percent of that. You know, everyone likes talking about their their wins, but in the end, I didn't win as much as I thought I did because I didn't know when to sell, and. <sighs> You know, but again, it was interesting for me because it created a certain amount of overconfidence in, in my case. You know, I was willing to, you know, kiss my biceps and say, woo, you're hot stuff. And in the end, I, I, I didn't know anything. Uh, I, I fell into a lucky situation. Um, I did well. But as I say, subsequently, the next four investments really taught me some huge lessons. So you got a million dollars you've sold. It, it's in your account now. And it sounds like you were itching to spend it after you made that huge win. Would that be an accurate statement? Yeah. So luckily, I my wife actually sort of said, you know, we should take some off the table. I'm like, no, no, it's going to go to two million. Like, like, let's not sell. Let's not sell. Let's share. Anyways, as marriage is, it's a compromise. Uh, we sold enough to buy our first house. So kudos to her because you know in the end you know that's ultimately what saved us but i was more keen to keep it in the market and, and it's an interesting psychology when you get into a winning situation the tendency is to think well it's gone this far it's going to go further but as i look at it in retrospect if i look at the chart there were massive signs that it was it was peaking and so in this in this win and in my subsequent losses i've really had to go back and take a look at how what mistakes did i lose or did i make and i made a lot of them 
um, what mistakes did I make that I could have avoided? And from there, I've tried to, to move forward. Chris, uh, I spoke uh, over the years with a very well-known resource fund manager, and he told me, Bill, when I feel too smart in my speculative resource investments, that's when I take money off the table and put it into real estate. And when I feel like the resource sector is horrible, that's when I take money from real estate and put it <laughs> into the resource sector. So that yeah. that went with me. So when I had my first multi-seven figure win, I took money from that. I bought a farm. I bought tractors. <laughs> I invested in real estate. I put it in real assets so that even if I lose on all my other small cap speculations, I told my wife, at least I got some like things I can literally walk <laughs> on or drive. <laughs> exactly. And and you know, I mean, I was I was young. I, mean, I was right out of school. I had like a negative net worth. I mean, I I to, to have this win, man, I was walking on air. Like it was it was a phenomenal feeling. Likewise, it was an incredibly awful feeling to then go through the next 10 years and learn everything that I thought I knew. And, you know, to part of the investment process that I found is, is learning how to sell. You got to learn how to take your wins and move on. And yeah, that's, that's a really tough lesson to have. So do you have a guiding principle now after you have a big win? Is there like a percentage which you'll allow yourself as agreed upon with your spouse <laughs> to redeploy into risky things and then the rest have to go into dividend yielding stocks or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you know, after after the fourth loss and I literally lost more than I had made in the first one, I had a choice. You know, I could either double down and take responsibility for the fact that I knew squat and continue to learn. And, and that was the biggest realization because I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about technical analysis. I didn't know very much about fundamental analysis. I knew, I knew a little bit and I had read a few books, but what I needed to determine was how I was going to solve the problem. Because here I was 15 years into my working career and I had gone backwards. So I just decided that I would do a hybrid of that uh, between my business and then half of my investments. I, I put half my investments into somebody managing it myself or their self. Um, and then I just decided that I would learn and just be a sponge. So my daily routine is I'm up at four, I work out for an hour, I do two hours of stock research and I go to work for eight hours and I come home and spend the rest of the evening with my wife. So yeah, it, uh, it takes a lot of dedication and part of it is just accepting the fact I screwed up. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta take responsibility for the fact that, you know, somebody can make a recommendation, but you don't know what's behind door two. And that is the problem because I being young and being full of overconfidence, I heard someone say this. So I said, well, this is going to do this. And I, you know, there were a lot of I knows instead of saying, huh, what's behind door number two for these people? You know, they sang a song, I drank Kool-Aid and I lost a lot of money because of it. Chris, do you think that if you didn't lose money on the other side of that million dollar gain, that what would have happened if you, if you didn't lose? <laughs> That's a good question. Right? I think think depending on you know if you make a gazillion dollars and you can retire and then put it all into you know gic's then it's all good right but um you know if you're going to continue playing the game what i've determined is that you just have to take your winnings and then put it into something safe and then and then you know constantly think about it as net worth you know that that's something that i really had trouble figuring out is that you got to think about net worth because you know you may make a million dollars in your first uh investment maybe your your net worth goes up to a million but what if what if it falls back like, even if i had taken half of that which i took some of it to buy this house but even if i taken half of that and put it into something stable it would have you know that, that itself was 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago right i even at four percent that's a huge nest egg for for most people including me so you know if i hadn't done that <laughs> knowing me i probably have have found some investment that I would have learned a lesson. Um, yeah, investing is interesting, right? Because it, it makes you learn more than anything about yourself. Like 
you know, are you overconfident? Uh, are you an over optimist? Um, do you take everybody at what they say? Um, are you interested in doing the amount of work that's required to get there? Um, are you trying to, this is interesting that I found myself doing. Are you trying to approve your thesis? Or are you trying to disprove your thesis? I spend all my time now trying to disprove my thesis. I'm looking at everything that will say, this is a crop. You got to get it. So are you, do you before, err on the side of optimism, the blue sky versus the risks? Yeah. Um, that's an interesting question. And if too. So, so who's to balance you? Is it your wife or is it somebody <laughs> else that <laughs> knocks some sense yeah, into you? Yeah. There's always got to be a balancing factor. And, and definitely my, my partnership is with my wife is, is a, is a balancing uh, thing. But I would say that, hmm, it's interesting how emotion plays into the whole invest investment thesis. I've been at the top and I've been at the bottom. So, you know, every time I think I'm happy, <laughs> you know, if I'm happy with my portfolio, I look at how I felt and I actually wrote myself notes. Like, it's funny, back in 2008, I wrote myself a note that actually Kind of brought tears to my eyes because i was down like the, the gut-wrenching feeling of losing money oh it, it's awful it, it's you know they always say it's four times worse than than winning uh it was at least 10 times like it was awful i had a young family uh business to run employees you know as behind the eight ball so you know you, you know for your listeners i would say you, you got to be careful because in the end you're sticking your neck out over that post and you got to be careful there are a lot of people singing various songs in the, in the process chris you're an accredited investor but you also buy in the open market can you kind of talk through the decision making you go through to whether you want to invest in a private placement or just buy the stock on the open market <laughs> yeah um i'm I'm not liquid enough personally to, to do uh, convertible debentures or anything like that. So generally, my process is uh, in, in the process of taking a look at uh, the lessons I needed to learn to move forward. The first thing I decided is that as I look back at my losses, there were clear chart indications that it was topping. And, you know, there was one company in particular I'll share, and it was a small high-tech company in finance and <laughs> it's funny i remember like it was yesterday you know the stock craters 23 percent on one day high volume so i call up the ceo and you know i was kind of at that point where i was networking trying to you know reach out to ceo cfos get an idea of what was going on i called the ceo i said what's going on he says ah uh, everything's good here everything's good you know somebody's quants just picked up or kicked in i'm like quant what what's a quant i didn't know what i didn't know and and you know bottom line is that was a foretelling of the fact that they lost a contract that was worth half of the revenue so when i look back at that i was like wow you knew nothing like as a me um so with that the first thing I did is I taught myself how to read a chart, you know, and from there I screen, you know, these days on the investment world, I mean, a lot of it's momentum. So good things beget good things, bad things beget bad things. And then from there, I started realizing that the, the arbitrage between smaller companies versus what it's worth, what it's worth versus what it's trading at is huge. So I started venturing into uh bankrupt company they were almost bankrupt companies that had great management that i felt confident but that were in a sector that had huge tailwinds so with that you know i've, I've kind of turned the ship around so you found your niche where you feel like you have an advantage i do and it's hard right as a, I'm, I'm just i'm just a little guy right i mean i you know i compared to the multi billions of the trillions of dollars flowing around the financial industry i mean i'm small right and uh, insignificant and once you realize that once you realize that what happens to you really doesn't make any difference the sun still comes up still sun still goes down um you know but in the end your life can be materially affected by poor decision making and poor allocation poor selling poor buying i mean 
the, the components of being able to do this successfully are huge. And that's why most people don't do it, right? Most people just say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to put my X number of dollars out to my financial advisor and let them put it in a mutual fund. They could charge me either 3% because they're worth it. I just can't buy that myself. So I decided to go on the route of, yeah, let's learn as much as we, as we can. Chris, with your funnel that brings you ideas for potential investments, whether it be a show like mine or something else or Twitter or something you see, can you talk about what you do with that information? So for example, as someone who runs a sponsored based podcast, literally, literally for the same sponsor, I have emails, people thanking me saying, because you featured this sponsor, I'm paying for my kid's education. And at this, with the same company, if it doesn't work out years later, you know, I listened to you and I lost my life savings. Thank you very much. How, how would you take like sponsored information from this show? What do you do with it? Uh, well, first of all, I would say that anybody putting any skin in the game needs to take responsibility for anything that they do. I mean, that's ultimately what I told myself. It's like, look, man, you, you mixed up your, your thing. You thought you knew more. You didn't know anything. You need to take responsibility. And the internet is littered with this recommendation, that recommendation. The question is, is it management that's trying to, you know, promote themselves so they get a, an easy out? I mean, there are so many curtains that there could be a, another motive in behind. But in answer to your question, you know, I, I will take ideas on the internet as merely ideas. And then I'll say, hmm, first of all, is it a sector that has headwinds? I mean, you know, or, or headwinds or tailwinds, and you sort of say, okay, well, that's a possibility. And then you sort of say, okay, well, is it in the market cap that I want it to be in? Because the smaller you go on market cap, the more liquid, illiquid it is, right? So it becomes like Hotel California. It's easy to get in, but you can't leave, right? So you have to be really, really careful that you don't down cap enough that you actually say hmm, this sector has a lot of tailwinds i feel good about this let's go into this because you may not be able to get out so again it just comes down to the challenge of investing there it's like a game of golf you can drive but can you putt can you, can you chip i mean there's, there's so many things that you have to look at but in uh, further in answer to your question i i run myself now through uh, a series of litmus tests uh, including, is it a sector that I want to be in? Is it a, is it, um, is the chart looking somewhat okay? Uh, what is the macro, you know, cause you really have to look at, you know, what's the economy doing? I mean, we get so many mixed messages now on the economy. Like what you, you sometimes you hear from one person, that's one thing, another person, that's another. So you got to kind of figure out what you believe is, is the macro, what I believe. I can only speak for myself. Um, but from there, ultimately, it just comes down to filtering, going through the financials. Is it an almost bankrupt company? Can they turn around? Does management have it? Have I talked to management? How do I, what's my gut feeling from them? Um, and and from there, you just kind of piecemeal your, your positions. Like they say they're going to do this. Well, if they don't do that, then a the little warning sign goes up. But, you know, you don't just go whole hog and put a whole bunch of money, which is exactly what I used to do. It's like, hey, it's a great idea. Let's go throw a wacky cash in there because I was right before. I'm going to be right again. So, again, this is the hubris that I feel, you know, kind of snuckered me. Chris, I had a really nice email I got from a listener in Australia, works a job, saved up six figures, deployed it into gold and silver stocks. He's very bullish gold and silver stocks. And he reached out and said, but I'm not confident enough in my own decision making ability with these small caps and was asking my advice, should I hire a professional advisor? Now you mentioned giving money to, you know, a mutual fund manager and he takes his 3% fee or whatever. But what are, what are your thoughts as someone who's kind of grown and learned, you've had the pains of loss, you've had the ecstasy of the wins. What do you think if someone's going to mess with these little small cap junior resource stocks, high risk, high reward, and if they're not confident, should they hire an advisor or should they stay away? Should they just buy an ETF? Any thoughts to share here? Well, I guess I would say caution, caution, caution. I mean, how will you feel if that hundred thousand dollars is gone? You know, is it going to ruin your marriage? Um, is it going to make it so that you're going to lose your job? I mean, 
you know, if, if you're, if you've lost, you know, your life savings, I'll tell you, it really affects your psyche. Like it's downright depressing. Um, so, you know, caution and, and the question really is, is how much do you really know? I thought I knew a lot and I didn't. I, I really didn't. And, and, you know, years after the fact, as I learn more and I become a sponge and I have been a sponge, but there's still stuff that I learn on a daily basis. You know, I was watching a podcast with uh, Louis Vassal Gave today and I was like, oh my God, like these, these guys are, you know, they think outside the bubble so far beyond where I am. And I'm just trying to, I'm trying to absorb this stuff. So in answer to your, your uh, listener, you know, be careful. I mean, there are sharks in the water and you got to know, you know, you, you take a little bit of risk, but until you have experienced the loss of that, maybe, you know, 1% of your pot of, of your portfolio. I don't know. I've done the opposite. I didn't think about it. Well, Chris, thanks for listening to the show. Thanks for coming on the show. This appearance doesn't necessarily do anything for you you didn't need to appear you're not promoting a newsletter or anything like that so i just wanted to say thank you for sharing in humility your experience with listeners um chris moore everybody take what he said don't let that hubris that i th i'm i made all this money because i'm so smart as you have some of these big wins maybe you had a big win in lithium or uranium over the last year or two or maybe you're going to have one in gold and silver if it keeps running over the next year or two don't let it go to your head. You're not as smart as you think you are, and you got to protect the cash that you made. Chris, any final thoughts? No, Bill, just thanks for doing what you do. I mean, you, you provide a, a service to uh, small investors, and I listen to you all the time. So thanks very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.